documentary you're about to watch was filmed 25 years ago in 1977 in the city of Perth, Western Australia. It was written, filmed, produced by Guy Basket, British producer who went down to um, Australia, uh, collected his crew, and then flew around the world to make it. The copy you have is an archive copy because all of the masters of this show have been destroyed in various house cleanings at the channel um, over the last 25 years. However, because one copy survived, uh, Channel 9 has given us very kindly the permission to reproduce this archive for you folks that have the Cosmic Conspiracy book. That's why you have this DVD in your possession. The documentary was originally uh, filmed, the first hour of it, without me. And uh, I was brought into this by a very peculiar circumstance which occurred there in Perth uh, a few weeks before this went to air. I was um, cleaning house and um, getting rid of you know, stuff for spring cleaning and there was a wooden um, clothes wardrobe uh, in Australia they don't have closets as much as they have wooden clothes hangers, you know, boxes, you know, nice decorative pieces that go in a bedroom. And I had too many of this old house that I was renting and uh, they were kind of falling apart in places so I wanted to take it to the garbage dump or the rubbish tip as they call it in Australia. So. I uh, got in the car, the station wagon, shoved this long, tall clothes wardrobe in it and drove out to the rubbish dip. When I got there, I waited in line like everyone else to drive up to throw my uh, garbage or that particular wardrobe over the side of a huge cliff of garbage down into the valley below, where all the rest of the rubbish was being shoved that day. So my time came and I got out of the uh, station wagon around the back and opened up the back door and put my hands on the wardrobe to start to pull it out and the guy behind me honks his horn and gets out. Young Billy comes over to him and he says, um, look, uh, mate, uh, are you going to throw that wardrobe away? And I said, yeah. And he says, oh, look, I wonder if I could have it. Uh, I just live a few blocks from here and you could just drive it over the house for me and, you know, I'd, I'd be pleased to have it. And I said, well, no problem. Well, with this, a crowd kind of started together around us and it wasn't other people dumping trash. It was the garbage guys uh, that had filed rights on this uh, garbage tip and the rights were to mine the garbage, you know, to pick out and sift through what they wanted for valuables and then resell it or use it. So they came across and said, oh, look, mate, the guy that was trying to get the water from me, you can't have this because uh, it's now in the tip, in the, in the rubbish uh, dump, and it is uh, ours. And so he turns to him and says, oh, no, it hasn't actually been taken out of the car yet. It's in his car, so he can take it over and give it to me at my house. Well, with this, these uh, garbage men, or miners of the garbage, whatever you want to call them, big fellas, started to kind of bristle up and walk over, you know, a bunch of them like they were going to have a little bit of fisticuffs with this. And uh, the uh, one of the guys got a, like a D9 dozer and started to move toward this guy's car behind me and started, he was going to push his car over the edge. And he says, we're going to push your car over the edge, mate, if you don't back off and let us have this wardrobe. So with this, the guy that was asking me for the wardrobe reaches in his pocket, pulls out his wallet, and he's an off-duty policeman. He says, right, the first one of you makes a move, I'm going to arrest you. Well, that kind of put a quiet on the whole argument. The policeman got in his car, he told me, follow me, and so I followed the guy. By this time, there'd been a crowd of people throwing the rubbish away watching all this, and a couple of the guys behind the policeman's car said, uh, oh, look, you mind if we come with you? So anyway, a little gaggle of us went over to the policeman's house and installed the wardrobe in his bedroom and had a cup of tea and coffee there with him and talked about you know, life, death, universe, and what I was doing in Australia and various things like that. And then I went home. Well, a couple of days passed and um, a man who's now a good friend of mine, but I didn't know at the time, came driving up to the um, front door of my house and he knocked and I let him in and he says, oh, look, my name is Hugh Kitson. Um, you know, I'm a film editor for Channel 9. And I said, oh yeah, I remember you at the policeman's house the other day. And he said, yeah. He said, I listened to a few things you were talking about, and I get the impression you know a bit about this UFO stuff. And I said, well, <laughs> a bit. And he said, well, we're doing a documentary, we've been keeping it very quiet, but we'd like for you to come in and uh, appear in it. So I said, all right, and uh, went down to the station, and uh, they did a, a test uh, interview and thought, right, okay, there's more to this, so we'll film it over at Hugh's house. So what you're going to see at the end of this documentary is the uh, interview they did with me, which is uh, probably 20 minutes or so, the last 20 minutes of the movie, um, which made the program 
so um, popular, apparently, that they got a 42% rating in the viewing audience. It was the highest rating they'd ever gotten on a documentary television program in, in the network up to that date. So I want you to bear that in mind. Uh, what you see here was uh, what we were telling people at the time, publicly, 25 years ago. You'll see Steven Spielberg in there, and his opinion basically uh, still hasn't changed on the UFO alien abduction thing. I think you'll find that very interesting. And uh, we have um, a number of other interviews with folks that uh, you won't ever get another chance to see because uh, they're now dead, like Dr. Alan Hynek and Betty Hill, who was abducted with her husband, Barney. So sit back, enjoy the show, and um, look for DV number two, which we're in the process of making now. Bye-bye. UFO phenomenon, and it is their opinion that UFOs are here. A major myth about UFOs is that only kooks, quacks, uh, nuts, strange people believe in them or are interested in them or see them. That's absolute nonsense. Western Australia is unique in the UFO problem because per capita, I believe it has more sightings than any other civilized area in the world. I think the meaning of the word UFO is that they are unidentified. And as long as they're unidentified, we better try to identify them. And that people, you know, waste a great deal of energy saying, do you believe in them? Well, the thing I believe in is they're unidentified. Actually, yeah, everybody I bumped in, bump into is either fascinated with the subject or willing to willing to listen people are describing um, a technology but they are really around the technology there are a number of uh, psychological and if you will even you know let's use the word psychic effects associated with it we did not notice teeth in fact when Barney was lying on the table looking up one of them appeared to have sort of a membrane which fluttered behind his lips. It looked like a thin skin. However you look at the phenomenon of UFOs, it is not the 99% you can explain, it's the 1% you can't. And in this last category, we include a sighting close to Perth in 1976. We talked to the Western Australian representative for Dr. Hynek's UFO Study Centre. Moonrise, 3.25 a.m., one mile north of Wanneroo, going towards Yanchep in Western Australia. Jeff Bell, what are we doing here? Well, on February 8, 1976, at this precise time and location, two chaps were going along this road, uh, north of uh, Wanneroo Road, and uh, they noticed something unusual, and uh, they sent us this report. Early on the morning of Sunday, February 8, 1976, while on our way fishing at Yanchep, we saw this red light low in the sky, approximately a mile north of Burns Beach turnoff in uh, Wanru Road. Uh, we talked about this thing, whether it was a, a plane or something else, and on approaching I could see it wasn't moving, we were catching up to it. Getting level uh, with this object, I couldn't see the red light on the back, so I asked my mate to stop, and I opened the passenger side door and watched this thing, and my mate moved over and watched with me. While we were looking, it was about uh, 150 feet up and about 90 degrees from the car, and I noticed it had pink lights coming from windows, uh, what looked like the front, and underneath it, it had this big 
shiny silvery light which looked like it was you know spinning around while watching this thing for four minutes it took off very very slowly in a southwest direction about 400 to 500 meters and stopped and hovered again uh, we watched it for about another minute and then we we packed them and took off do you think that looks like a hollywood movie or is what they are saying so unbelievable Star Wars, the film that is likely to make more money than any other in history, is only letting us get out of the observer's seat and into the pilot's. That, after all, is where we'd all like to be. fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. This is the extraordinary motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Jaws. That's a 20-footer. 25. Three tons on them. Hurry up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Now! Before Star Wars, Jaws grossed more money at the box office than any other film. At an exclusive interview in Hollywood, its director, Steven Spielberg, told us that while he was up to his neck in water filming Jaws, he was really thinking of his next film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a film concerned with UFOs. Just after Jaws finished, uh, I came back and I wanted to relate to dry land and I also wanted to think about Close Encounters, so I went out to Pear Blossom, which is the desert near Mojave, there's nothing around for miles, and uh, if you want to watch the cosmos, that's the place to stand and do it. I mean, you feel like a grain of salt, and the stars are so vast. I mean, it's almost like looking down at the sky because the sky surrounds you. It's, it's an amazing planetarium show. And I went out there, and I parked my car, turned the lights out, and sat on the roof, and looked up at the sky, and said to myself, if something comes down here right now and lands on the road and an opening appears, would I get on and take a ride? And I thought about it, and I looked up at the sky, and I got very, very nervous because I realized that I wouldn't get on and take a ride. As a matter of fact, I was getting so nervous by embracing and romancing that thought that I got back in my car and I drove back to Los Angeles. I was terrified. Most people think the interest in UFOs is limited to a few cranks. In fact, there are thousands of intelligent people who get together at international conferences all over the world to study them. We visited one at Chicago to interview the man who for 20 years was head of the U.S. Air Force top security investigation into UFOs, Dr. Alan Hynek. It's uh, particularly heartening to me to see the rise of interest among scientists and particularly astronomers uh, in the UFO problem. So it has often been said that uh, why don't astronomers see UFOs? As a matter of fact, they do. In a very recent report uh, by Professor Sturrock of Stanford University, who um, queried all the members of the American Astronomical Society, found that 53% of those who responded said that in their opinion, the UFO problem was, was worthy of scientific study. And what is more, 64 of the astronomers who responded uh, gave what would be called UFO reports, objects, sightings that they personally had made at their observatories frequently, which to them was unexplained. One of the most important findings that uh, has been made about this phenomenon is that it is global in scope. In other words, it's, it doesn't belong to uh, the French or the Americans or the British. Or, uh, there have been waves of sightings, uh, usually lasting about uh, a few weeks or a month or a month and a half, over very, uh, in very concentrated fashions in certain areas of the world. There have been such waves 
in Western Europe in 1954, for example, in this country in 1947, we know of waves in the Soviet Union, in China, in Australia, especially in Western Australia. And what is typical about these waves is that the, the, the people from all these different cultures around the world are describing the same thing in their own terms. What they are describing is an object that seems to be able to, to maneuver, it seems to be a technology, seems to come to the ground and leave traces and there have been rings especially that have been found uh, burned circles that have been found very commonly in Australia that uh, are absolutely identical to uh, things that have been catalogued in this country in France there is now a catalog of such traces that encompasses more than a thousand sightings an ordinary man in an ordinary street in America but this man started the 1947 wave of sightings that swept the world when he claimed to have seen from his mountain rescue plane nine disc-like objects, roughly 45 miles away, flying at a speed of approximately 1,500 miles per hour near Mount Rainier, Oregon. The date? June 24, 1947. Later, when asked by a reporter to describe how they flew, Arnold said their motion was like saucers skipping over water. In the papers the next day, the world first saw the term flying saucer. On June 24, 1977, 30 years to the day after he first sighted them, Ken Arnold consented to speak to us. He had refused to make any public statements for the last five years. It's easy to see that after 30 years, He's still angry at the disbelief. All right here, we've seen something, I've seen something, hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have doodle, uh, dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously. Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than, than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything as far as I'm concerned. Arnold's sighting amazed many people, but none more than publisher Ray Palmer. Kenneth Arnold fits into it. Uh, this is his 30th anniversary, and strangely enough, it's my 33rd, because I knew about flying saucers three years before Kenneth Arnold made his first sighting. In the middle 40s, a man called William Shaver had written to Palmer about his alleged visit to a subterranean culture, peopled by beings he referred to as Deros and Teros. What he wrote was to create another legend of UFO mythology. Briefly, it was the story of, of, a, of a radioactive flare from the sun around 12,000 years ago, which virtually wiped out life on Earth. And the survivors fled into space in spaceships, while the, the, the persons left behind, whom he called Abandoned Darrow, uh, went into, into the cavern world and set up a civilization there, which from that time on became contaminated because the atmosphere had to be drawn from the surface and so on in the water. So they gradually degenerated into what he called Daros. Uh, D meaning detrimental or destructive, and Ro be being a shortening of robot or robotic. In other words, he felt that these people were mentally controlled by robotic Dero influences. In other words, the radioactivity in their brain made them insane. But they had at their access uh, the wonderful machines left by this civilization which fled the earth which had been taken down into the caves, and among them was a craft they called a Rolat. Ro again for robotically controlled, uh, uh, instrumentally controlled, and so on. And in the caves they used these things, which were discs about 30 feet in diameter, to go through tunnels and the tortuous caves underneath the ground for hundreds of miles, even from continent to continent. And they were controlled automatically so they did, did not touch the floor, the ceiling, or the walls, and therefore they had this flipping motion, and they went through caves where they had a right angle turn. They traveled around 1,200 miles an hour. When uh, Shaver heard about Kenneth Arnold's sighting, he wrote me very triumphantly and said, you see, these Rolats do come out of the caves. Perhaps the greatest surprise was when Arnold reported his sighting to the nearest U.S. military air base, he found on the wall of the commander's office this classified gun sight photograph which bore a remarkable resemblance to what Arnold claimed he had just seen and Shaver had discussed three years before. Something else Ken Arnold didn't know was that Dr. Hynek was officially researching UFOs for the US Air Force and compiling a classified report known as Project Sign, later to become known as Project Blue Book.
Well, it was as an astronomer that I first became associated with the UFO problem. In 1948, the Air Force asked me, as an astronomer, to assist them in seeing how many of the reports on flying saucers that were coming in at that time could be explained astronomically. And one thing led to another, and I became scientific consultant to the Air Force and remained so for some 20 years. I started almost as a complete skeptic because I thought the whole thing was a question of post-war nerves, but it was the persistence of the phenomenon it refused to dry up and blow away that finally led me to the belief that we had a real phenomenon to deal with. In the years that followed, Hynek was to investigate reports from all over the world. Soon clips of film like this one began to reach him. This unique film that we've managed to obtain has puzzled scientists and experts all over the world and to this day remains a truly unidentified flying object. Meanwhile, the media still referred to them as flying saucers, when in 1955 a group of Italian scientists and cameramen went to photograph an eclipse of the sun from three miles up, they were delighted to find not one, but a group of objects which they proceeded to photograph. Next week, the world's cinema screens carried the title, Three Miles Up, Flying Saucers. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the advent of the flying saucer. And that is a most unfortunate term, in my opinion, because it invites ridicule, it opens the door to a great deal of buffoonery and lampooning. It had a perfectly good history because when Kenneth Arnold described the motions of the discs that he had seen, he said that it was like skipping a saucer over water. But some reporter thought that was a very clever uh, term and flying saucers were born. But it, it's, it is really too bad because it has caused a great deal of uh, jokes and so forth. For instance, uh, uh, one common expression is that if you want to see a flying saucer, just goose a waitress. What do experts believe UFOs look like? Uh, typically we're dealing with apparently round, symmetric, disc-shaped objects, definite size, shape, surface texture, bigger in diameter than they are in thickness. Uh, protuberances that might be landing gears or antenna windows might be decorations too, we don't really know. Things with definite size, shape, surface texture. There are other reports of things with, that are cylindrical, long cigar-shaped objects. And if you look at the landing cases, and of course I'm most concerned with landing cases, because then we have something to work with. These are cases, landing trace cases, where a UFO is seen on or near the ground, and after it leaves one finds physical changes produced in the environment. If you look at those cases, and one researcher has collected more than a thousand such cases from 55 countries, and they're similar, whether you're dealing with sightings uh, in Australia, New Zealand, you got the same landing traces as in the United States, as in South Africa, as in Canada, England, France, all over the world. There aren't any laws of physics that stand in the way of flying saucers, either getting here from other star systems or performing here once they're here. Uh, many people think that you can't get here from there. The fact of the matter is that there are published studies by reputable engineers and scientists in good technical journals showing that trips to nearby stars, and I don't worry about the distant ones, are feasible with reasonable round trip time shorter than a person's lifetime without violating any of the laws of physics and using staged fission or fusion propulsion systems on both of which I have worked. Now, I, we physically tested fission nuclear propulsion systems when I was at Westinghouse. In 1967, we tested the NRXA-6, less than three feet in diameter, power level 1,100 million watts. That's roughly the same energy it takes to light this, to provide the electricity for the city of Perth. As Perth, the city of light, was viewed by Apollo astronauts, other UFO sightings were being made in Australia. Dr. Hynek's worldwide organization has a branch in Sydney, headed by Harry Griesberg and Bill Chalker. Sightings in Australia are so numerous that a special computer is needed to handle them. I work with computers. I got actively involved with the UFO Investigation Centre after an experience of my own. 
We started out with a very small machine, which we were able to recover from scrap and make it do what we wanted to do with it. But since then the files have grown and we now have several thousand files um, which we can look at and reference whenever we need. And this requires a much larger machine. It's hard to imagine uh, here in the middle of Sydney amongst all this modern technology how Fred Birmingham, a Parramatta surveyor, would have reacted to what he saw. He described seeing a strange aerial object shaped like a, an arc uh, moving in, in, in a zigzag manner and apparently landing in nearby Parramatta Park. What followed uh, he was a, a description of meeting a being he called a spirit and an invitation to visit and, and walk on board this arc. Uh, it paralleled uh, many stories that are similar to it right around the world. And uh, you read about these stories in newspapers all the time. But uh, this story, in fact, is, is what constitutes the first recorded close encounter in Australia, the date 1868. As an industrial chemist, uh, I specialise in the study of what we term um, close encounters of the third kind. In this type of UFO sighting, um, uh, an unidentified aerial object um, interacts with the physical environment, thereby leaving a, a permanent uh, physical record of its presence. What is the RAAF's official view of this? We visited them to find out. Squadron Leader White, you're with the Department of Defence here in Canberra. Is your function to deal with UFO inquiries entirely? Uh, only partly. Um, in Air Force office here I have several duties, one of which is to deal with what we prefer to call unusual aerial sightings. Ah, now you departed from UFO uh, for any particular reason? Yes, we think there's a fairly good reason um, to call them UFOs. The unidentified part of that statement is assuming immediately that we don't know what it is that people are seeing. Uh, also objects, what people see are not necessarily objects, they can be weather factors, marsh gas, lightning, that sort of thing. Uh, the main problem that we see is the term UFO immediately conjures up in people's minds flying saucers, little green men. Yeah. So unusual aerial sightings we prefer. Are there unusual aerial sightings that cannot be explained? Oh, most definitely, yes. Yeah. Is there a sort of percentile there somewhere that... I'd say about 90% uh, we can explain, 10% uh, on average we can't for various reasons. Um, they may be put in too late, uh, insufficient information, yeah. some are hoaxes, but definitely some we cannot explain. Yeah. Well, what's the, it's a fairly uh, unusual thing and, and we appreciate it very much that we can talk to you because it's, I think, fairly rare that um, you give interviews at all. Correct. Thank you. Uh, what's the official policy that I think we should establish. For yes, you. I think so. Um, in the early 1950s, about the mid-1950s, um, the government of Australia, along with the governments of America and United Kingdom, uh, thought there might be some threat to national security with the sightings of all these peculiar happenings. So they asked the RAAF to investigate all the reports and come up with the facts. And after about 10 or 12 years, uh, we could not produce any information that suggested there were any interlopers from outer space. Uh, the 10% or so unexplained, we couldn't explain, but on the other hand, they didn't suggest any interlopers. The one thing, of course, that the UFO societies say to me is that they believe that the RAAF is passing information to the USAF uh, and other countries. Is, is that true? Not exactly. We don't have any direct liaison with the USAF or the RAF, um, but certainly we get inquiries from overseas, from the UFO societies, from people, and we will answer them. If they want information on our sightings, then we'll send it to them. It is possible that some of these reports will filter their way back to the USAF, but we have no direct liaison. That was the military air arm point of view. What about the civilian aviation scene? This confidential report from a civil airline captain was given to us reporting an incident that took place over Western Australia in 1976. 
The Department of Transport knew of no known traffic in the vicinity and the Met Office knew of no possible cause for turbulence. If the turbulence we hit was caused by an object, I'd estimate it was moving at, say, between Mark 2.5 to Mark 3. That's uh, around 2,000 miles an hour. Passengers were hurt and the stewardess was off for six months and uh, with an injured back and seats were broken. We also spoke to a local air traffic controller who wishes to remain anonymous. I've been a radar controller for something over 10 years and during that time I've seen several returns on the radar screen. They appear out of nowhere and they, they disappear and they don't appear to be able to be explained by the stock answers which we, we can put to such uh, returns such as uh, flocks of birds, um, balloons moving downwind. Some of these returns have been moving against the prevailing winds. Nothing as dramatic as perhaps the air traffic controllers in the States have uh, where they've actually been able to investigate such sightings with aircraft. Nothing as spectacular as that. Nonetheless, something that I can't explain. And from Kalgoorlie Airport last year, a report from the duty meteorologist. The UFO passed across the sky from the northeast to the southwest, not directly overhead, but a little to the south of me. The object looked oval from my viewing angle. It appeared in size about half that a five cent coin would be when held at arm's length. It was white, and the whiteness seemed brightest at the edges, which uh, weren't sharply defined. There was no sound, and not knowing the size of the object, it was pretty impossible to estimate its altitude. The UFO took about 10 seconds from when I first sighted it in the northeast to when it appeared to stop in the southwest at about 40 to 45 degrees elevation. Uh, it seemed to stay there for about uh, five seconds, then it seemed to just vanish instantly without moving from the spot. With a jumbo cargo of over 300 people, the responsibility on the pilot is tremendous. Do they ever see anything unusual? Flying on Eastern Airlines from LA to New Orleans and uh, my production designer who was on the airplane with me was talking to the stewardesses about the movie we were making and he mentioned one of the stewardesses that it was a uh, film about dealing you know with UFOs and the stewardess apparently went into the cabin and mentioned this to the pilot and all of a sudden this big steely gray haired guy with wings on his chest com he comes out the pilot of the airplane they point me out he sits down next to me and he said uh, are you will this be a serious movie or is this just going to be a, a comedy or a, or a sci or sci-fi and I said no we were taking the subject very serious and then knowing that I wasn't about to laugh in his face and ridicule what he was about to tell me he sat down he told me two experiences he had while flying with Eastern one was a nocturnal light that traveled very very quickly across his glide path it startled everybody because of its speed it wasn't a shooting star it wasn't up there it was eye level and moving very 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 quickly something that was it was passing very close across his bow in the shadow of some of the world's tallest buildings we were told of the most dramatic ufo experience that a human being has claimed so far So we're traveling along when suddenly a very strange looking maneuvering craft started following us for several miles. In an area called Indian Head, this craft left the highway, came out, I mean, excuse me, left the top of the mountain, came out over the highway and stopped in midair. And we could see it through the binoculars. A curved windows, red light on each side. Now Barney decided to get out and try to identify this craft. And he saw a group of human-like figures standing in the window looking down at him. And he had the feeling that he was being told to keep looking, don't be afraid, no harm's going to come to you. And at that point, the craft started to descend. Barney was filled with fear, thinking he was going to be captured. He ran back to the car and we took off speeding down the highway. We heard a series of beeping sounds. And a few miles beyond this, we heard a second series of beeping sounds. Now later, in our investigation of this, we began to realize that we could not remember what had happened between the two series of beeping sounds. When the story leaked out, an eminent psychologist placed Betty and Barney into deep hypnosis. 
The hypnosis proved that Bonnie and I had been captured and taken on board a UFO. If we, after the first series of beeping sounds, we were speeding down the highway. Bonnie left the main highway onto a side road and then a sudden left hand turn onto a very narrow wood road. The beings whom he had seen on board the craft were now standing in the middle of this road. And the car motor stalled. Bonnie was trying and trying to stop the car. It wouldn't start. They separated, came up, and took us out of the car in two groups. They took us through a path in the woods to where the craft was on the ground. Took us on board, took us into separate rooms, gave us physical examinations. And during this examination, we learned they had put a cup-like instrument on Bonnie's abdomen. Now, later when we returned home, this Bonnie developed a pattern of warts in a perfect circle. And we never knew until the hypnosis that that was the spot where the, this cup-like instrument was put onto him. Well, you're one of the few people to have met aliens. What do they look like? They all had very, very large eyes, very small nose, thin slit for a mouth, no hair, no eyebrows, eyelashes, and no this part of the ear that we could see. We did not notice teeth. In fact, when Barney was lying on the table looking up, one of them appeared to have sort of a membrane which fluttered behind his lips. It looked like a thin skin. But it's not an exclusive American right to see UFOs. One of the most credible witnesses we interviewed was an Australian minister, the Reverend William Gill, posted before the time of his sighting to the Anglican mission in Boinai, Papua New Guinea. One night at 7.45, as he stood with 38 other people at the edge of the mission playing field, every one of them saw the same thing. Can you imagine what it's like to look up in the sky and see a totally foreign looking object. They're sta uh, just hovering, uh, not very far high up, maybe two or three hundred feet uh, up in the air and glowing and two uh, bipods jutting out from behind it, from uh, underneath it and sparkling all around and some figures up there this solid looking object and figures walking about on top and not the slightest noise whatsoever and so we waved wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get this object down onto the playing field and as we waved wondering whether we'd get some recognition and whether perhaps they would uh, understand what we wanted, they waved back. So I asked a boy to go quickly down, bring me a torch, bring me a pencil, bring me paper, and uh, return as quickly as he can so that I can get if, or any other events that occur, and minute by minute movements, um, so that at least we'd be able to, uh, to talk about it the next day. And this he did very, very quickly. He brought it back and he brought the, to the torch and put the torch on and shone it to the, the craft and uh, as he did so he waved the or uh, moved the torch uh, this way and we were dumbfounded when we looked at the craft and the craft was as though it was responding to the torch uh, it began to do this too you know like a, uh, a, a disc shaped object just uh, moving the same way uh, responding to the, to, to the movement of the torch. Next day, uh, just prior to the evening service, about seven o'clock, um, the thing was there again. It uh, had arrived uh, about an hour earlier, and um, we all decided to uh, have the normal even song that we uh, do have on, uh, on those uh, nights, uh, because, uh, well, the thing was out there outside the church anyway, and, and uh, we felt it wouldn't go away during the service, uh, and it didn't. Uh, when we came out, uh, there it was, still up in the sky. 
And so for another hour or two we watched. Um, and then suddenly it did go. And uh, there was this amazingly incredible speed uh, that the whole craft disappeared uh, to nothing uh, across the bay uh, in a matter of a second or so. From New Guinea to China, from China to Peru, native customs and beliefs reflect the history of such visits from gods of the sky. The sky spirits of Australian Aboriginal myth are these Wanjina from the Kimberley. How similar they are to our own astronauts. The UFO phenomenon didn't really start in 1947. We have many sightings from during the war, before the war, in the 19th century, and going back as far as we have records. And in that regard, I've been especially fascinated by the possible parallel between UFO sightings and folklore. If you think of the, uh, the Wingina uh, drawings, for example, in Australia, if you think of similar uh, cave drawings in, from China to the Sahara, if you think of the Celtic traditions in Brittany, in the Celtic, in the Celtic countries, if you think of the uh, American Indian folklore, all of those have certain common preoccupations with beings coming from the sky, beings wearing some, some sort of, of suit, uh, beings, uh, the, the, the whole mythology of contact between men and another culture possibly coming from space. One night about ten years ago in Floriot Park in Perth, Paul Moink saw something he couldn't quite explain. Paul, tell me about that. Um, well, it would have been around about ten or eleven years ago. I think it would be around about 1966. I was going to bed, it would have been about eleven or twelve o'clock at night. Uh, I laid in bed, looked out through the window, and I saw this thing going backwards and forwards and extremely fast. I couldn't work out what it was, so I jumped out of bed, got both my parents out of bed, and a friend who was staying with us at the time, so there's four of us actually seeing it, so I wasn't by myself. And uh, we stood out here and watched it for quite some time. And we thought, uh, what the heck is it? It was just too fast to be a, a jet. It was, it was changing direction too fast to be anything but, uh, I, I would say, a UFO. In the same year, this photograph, claimed to be a UFO, was taken from Kings Park in Perth, four miles away from where Paul's family live in Floriot Park. Well, we got a surprise because we didn't know actually what it was. And we were puzzled and uh, we couldn't tell the shape of it because it was going too fast and uh, it was going, uh, it was flying actually like a kite, but much faster. Well, actually, when we came out here to look at it, uh, we noticed we couldn't work out the distance it was because it was sort of about the height of those clouds there and it was going between that lamp pole and that pine tree on the other side there backwards and forwards the way a kite would do if it was held there it goes backwards and forwards like that but it was not a kite because it couldn't go so far and it couldn't be lit up the way it was it was yellow and was going backwards and forwards pretty fast and it, well it looked very unusual you know and rather interesting but uh, of course it was fairly late and uh, but it looked like a ufo i really did think that you know because i'd never seen anything like that before honestly I hadn't. what happened in the end paul well the fact that it was going backwards and forwards so fast it wasn't actually stopping at each time that it got to the point that i wanted to turn at it was just going there and straight back again so it wasn't stopping and um after, the, after it had been doing this for quite some time, it wasn't lighting anything up or looking at anything, it didn't seem to be, but it just disappeared straight away from us, straight off into the north. Fast? Fast, yeah, it just disappeared, like it was going away so fast that it disappeared into the, into the horizon sort of thing. Could the swift disappearance, so typical of UFOs, be caused by pursuit, as in this clip from 20th Century Fox... Well, it was on the 6th of January 1968, just by the edge of the riverbank near this golf course, that I witnessed the landing of no less than two flying saucers, a negative craft and a, and a good guy's craft. There are both good guys and bad guys. And the whole thing started off when the State Electricity Commission built a 66,000 volt power station next door to my home and these attracted the flying saucers which came and had a look at it while it was in its construction stages and when it was switched on especially they came around in droves measuring the magnetic fields around it. In those days in 1968 we had Essendon Airport in Melbourne uh, Tullamarine hadn't been built and aircraft took off like flocks of birds all over the place and this particular plane had to bank on this evening the 6th of the first 68 in order to miss this flying saucer 
which then, after it left the paper mills, trundled off across the sky over here to the Q Boulevard. So I had my camera loaded up with 400 ASA black and white 8mm film and I took it and followed this UFO down by the roadside, by the river, and I got some spectacular film of a landing. I had a sudden impression to look up and lo and behold this light in the sky was getting bigger and bigger and I realised it was going to land. And um, it did land, but I was so surprised because watching a UFO land isn't any normal event. I was so surprised I didn't get a picture of the first landing and just as well because this was a landing by the men in black what we know as the negative flying saucers. But after I'd recovered from my surprise, I did get uh, enough gumption to photograph the second UFO, which came from Ashtar Command, which was in hot pursuit of this first UFO. And this is the one that landed uh, in the movie film I took. Now, 10 years later, this is the spot where the flying saucer landed. And I revisited the location and this is an approximate angle uh, of what I shot on my movie film ten years later on today. This picture was taken the morning after the landing. It left a burnt circle 60 feet big in the grass. This second picture was taken seven years later of the same burnt circle and as you see nothing has grown on the spot. Well now Let's take a look at the burnt circle ten years later and see whether or not anything has grown. Yes, well this is the burnt circle. Um, a lot of flying saucer landings leave burnt circles and uh, Nothing has grown on this one since the original landing on that particular night. And over the years, we've come back to the boulevard and checked this area and found no growth on the burnt circle. Along with Shaver, Colin Cameron claims to have had contact with the subterranean Deros and Terros here in Australia. This belief should not be dismissed too lightly. Ray Palmer came out with some astonishing details about Shaver's uh, experience. I think Mr. Shaver, well, he originally claimed that he spent eight years in these caves with these Darrow and Tarot people, T being, e being integrative. And I discovered later, much to my embarrassment, uh, that he had spent these eight years in the Ypsilanti State Hospital for the Insane in Michigan. I contacted the doctors, and they said he was catatonic. He lived in a world even had to feed him in this imaginary world of his except for one thing when Kenneth Arnold uh, saw the flying saucers I put together two and two and I said is the man catatonic or is, is there something else going on but I got 50,000 letters we ordinarily get 50 or 60 a month from people who said Mr. Shaver is telling the truth and not only that I have been in the caves too and I hear the voices. I've been hearing these voices now for, oh, for about the next seven years onwards, every night. And uh, until I started taking some infrared film, which I'd read in a book by, I um, can't think of his name now, but uh, Trevor James. And um, he had, at the suggestion of Ashtar Space Command, taken infrared photography and got these invisible flying saucers. So I thought, well, as these entities were invisible and they were bothering me, I'd try some infrared film too. And that's where I got these pictures of these entities. And, uh, and after those nights, um, what was happening to me was I was starting to hear these voices, just like Shaver was, uh, saying I was going to die, saying they were going to get me, saying they wanted to stop me researching into flying saucers and generally trying to terrify me, but I was never scared throughout the whole thing. This is what's kept me going. Brilliant brains, including Nobel Prize winners around the world, are still puzzling not are there UFOs, but what are UFOs? We talked to Klaus Nobel himself. It's something that man cannot comprehend. I think it's very likely that uh, uh, there are unexplained phenomena and uh, uh, I certainly have many times 
hope that they would come and visit us now and tell us here on earth uh, that uh, we are in the process of doing things that are not really in our best interest because right now it seems like we are self-destructive and I would like to have them to come visit us. My personal opinion today is that the flying saucers exist in our atmosphere, they are intelligently controlled, that they, are, they do uh, convey or carry uh, people just as real as you and I, except in a different sense. Personally, I'd say I'm an agnostic, if one can apply that term to the subject. Uh, I've seen many reports. Some of them are definitely weird, but until I see one, I don't believe. But I'm not going to say they're not there. Well, now, what are we to think of this kind of phenomenon people claiming to see uh, things such as I did. There are 38 of us and we all believe that we saw it but of course we don't expect other people to believe us if, we, if they don't want to. And I have very little time with the attitudes of traditional science which behave much more like religious dictatorships in many instances than they do like open-minded scientific communities. We have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously? Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than, than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything, as far as I'm concerned. If 15 million people did collectively see something like this flying over a major city, as here in Perth, Australia, experience leads us to believe that there would be a complete breakdown of the social order like the riots in New York when the lights went out. In the MGM film Soil and Green, we get a taste of the chaos the future may hold. I wouldn't put it past this government that a cosmic water gate has been underway for the last, you know, 25 years. And at the same time, I don't think it's, uh, I think as we're growing up, or from the government's point of view, uh, I think we've, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've been adults uh, for hundreds of years, but from the government's point of view, uh, we're still growing up, and eventually they might want to tell us something about what they've uh, discovered over, over, over the decades. Uh, there is a rumor that was in U.S. News and World Report a number of months ago that uh, Jimmy Carter might make, a, uh, uh, make some unsettling disclosures about the UFO phenomena sometime in December. Uh, it, it's perfect timing. I opened my movie in December, so it's perfect timing. There is a shyness and a reluctance on the part of many witnesses, and understandably so, uh, against reporting because too many have been ridiculed and life has been made somewhat miserable for them. But at the Center for UFO Studies, both in uh, the States and in Australia, is our, it is our standard practice never to use a person's name without their specific permission. So if any of our viewers have a what they feel is a valid UFO experience and have not reported it, by all means, I would say it is your scientific duty to report this and with the assurance that your names will not be used without your permission. A graduate nuclear physicist in America felt it his duty to report a sighting he shared with 12 other people. Perhaps he will prove, in the light of future events, to be the most credible witness of all. This rare official document was signed by the then governor of the state of Georgia, now the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. As we were about to finish this documentary, another intriguing explanation of UFOs was given to us by an ex-FBI informer, now living in Perth. A research physicist, what he has to say is what he believes to be the truth. It is so staggering, we felt we should extend this program so that he could be heard. This scientist believes that man holds the secret of anti-gravity and can produce flying sources at will. We interviewed him at a private house in Perth. Well, originally I didn't start to uh, investigate UFO phenomena. Um, I suppose I started studying the physics that led me to this point. 
62 to um, 64 at the United States Air Force Academy as a cadet and a special government program. As you're aware, the Air Force Academy is outside NORAD in the, the Colorado Mountains. It's a few miles up the hill from it. And I was trained there with um, 180 some odd other characters uh, to uh, do research in areas of um, electrogravitics later. Uh, we were programmed with libraries of information by slides flashed up on a wall at the rate of 200 pages a second. We couldn't even read them, but they were being implanted in our minds subliminally. It was a very classified project, and for the most part of it, while we were being programmed, we weren't aware of what was going on. We, we had normal classes in uh, physics and uh, calculus and this sort of things, but this stuff was being programmed in so that we had to assimilate it or bring it to our conscious mind over the months and years that followed in dreams and uh, kind of uh, um, daydream periods during the day when we're awake. But um, well, I left the academy in 64. I had a top secret security clearance with the government and then eventually that lapsed to secret. And I did a bit of time in the reserves, Air Force Reserves with the Strategic Air Command outside of uh, Fort Worth. And then um, I proceeded to uh, do private research in this electrogravitics, uh, thinking that I had uh, cracked the secret of anti-gravity all by myself and jumping up and down in my father's labs and mines in, in Dallas and um, one day I was approached by the government uh, and a kind of a an emissary from Dr. Edward Teller's office, uh, Dr. James R. Maxfield and he told me uh, what I'd been doing in my lab and the details of stuff I haven't even written down or told anybody he knew and um, he had other people like myself sponsored in the, this kind of research around the country and that was the first time that I knew that the U.S. government was actively involved, had been, and was still actively involved in the uh, control of gravity with electricity. And who did this man represent? Well, his job, uh, as his job qualification is, is he's the director of the James R. Maxfield Radiation Research Clinic in Dallas, Texas, the uh, same Maxfield that uh, invented the irradiated thread treatment uh, for uh, cancer of various organs. Um, if you look at his little dossier that's in the who's who, you find that he was uh, on the President's National Security Advisory Board, which is uh, really a rather important nog in the U.S. intelligence system. Uh, Kissinger would have been on the same rank. Um, you find that he uh, was closely affiliated with Dr. Edward Teller, who was the um, kind of dubbed the father of the hydrogen bomb project in the United States, but he told me that Dr. Teller was the head of uh, anti-gravity research there, uh, had been, I don't know whether he still is, and that he had worked on a similar project with him. In fact, the uh, letter that you and I uh, viewed uh, earlier from my files from Dr. Maxfield to this government and to Sir John Williams uh, did mention that fact, if you recall. So what happened to you then? Well, um, they suggested that I finish my research in Australia. I uh, wasn't enthralled with the idea, but uh, Dr. Maxfield told me that uh, I would be paid to come down and that uh, I was to call the Australian consulate in um, San Francisco and ask for Bob Gray and tell him that, uh, in these words, that I was a member of Maxfield's party. At the same time that uh, I was being approached by Dr. Maxfield's party to come down here and finish my research, I'd been approached already by the FBI and was working for them as an informant. That doesn't mean that you're a trained agent. It just means that you're somewhere in industry where they need someone. They don't have time to get them in there. Informing on what? Well, the particular thing I was to inform on was the comings and goings of various people from the White House to my uh, group of companies in uh, Dallas and also their connection to Israel and the Middle East political situation. Um, and I did my job uh, rather well, just reporting who came and went and various uh, amounts of money and things that I didn't know that transferred. Um, there were about seven or 800 of us uh, in the United States that were um, uh, employed by the FBI in this manner. I didn't take money, I took information in exchange. But um, at any rate, they came and told me, the FBI did, that uh, I'd been compromised. Uh, by a break-in in one of their agencies in Louisiana or someplace like that, and that I was going to get shot, and uh, which they'd explained to me at the beginning, the, the risks involved, but uh, I thought they were joking until I went back to the, um, uh, the office, um, uh, the computer division there in Dallas, and uh, was sacked, given 30 minutes to clean up my desk and leave, and uh, by an old friend of mine. And so he accused me of being the head of a big spy ring and all kinds of stuff, and so I left. And, uh, in fact, I didn't have my last meeting with the FBI, and I didn't have my last meeting with Dr. Maxfield. I just uh, bundled a few things and the family into a plane and uh, headed for Australia. 
I did make it, and I was quite, quite glad to, and uh, kept a very low profile for seven months. But I continued to do my research, and I wrote Dr. Maxfield a letter, and that was perhaps my mistake. I said, look, I've done it. I've figured out the wave uh, equation that we were looking for. And again, in my ignorance, I didn't realize how much work had already been done and gone before me. I was just kind of on the periphery or the edge of this whole development. That's a device to be able to make things like flying saucers mm. fly, is it? Yes. Also, it's a device to store um, energy in the form of motion, uh, like of a, uh, a small star or a big atom. It's called, this is a long word, an MHD plasma, magnetohydrodynamic plasma, like ball lightning. And it contains itself, but it's a way to turn all sorts of electricity into a high-voltage battery. Now, this would have been an immediate solution for the Middle East uh, uh, oil blockade at that time. Now, um, I wrote the letter uh, in good faith trying to say, look, we can stop the threat of war in the Middle East by using this as an alternate energy source. It's very portable. It's non-polluting. It had some byproduct radiation problems, but things we could solve. It would be cleaner than fission or fusion. Now, that's when um, people here in this country... Uh, uh, at the aeronautical research labs, uh, politicians started to get a hold of me. ASIO contacted me. Good grief. Uh, an odd infinitum uh, chain of uh, intelligence people, including two CIA people from the States. Uh, and then the FBI eventually started looking for me in this country, and uh, that again was after the intelligence war over there, after Hoover died. Um, and I was uh, unable to finish my research in this country. In fact, I met many dead ends in government departments and research facilities where they told me privately, like... Uh, uh, Dr. Tom Keeble in the Aeronautical Research Labs, he told me, yes, we know about the flying saucers your countrymen have built and in England and in Canada. And, uh, in fact, we have film records of them here in the RAAF uh, files. I said, uh, I want to stop you there. Yeah. Are you saying, Stan, that there are such things as, let's call them flying saucers, but they are built on Earth? Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that I um, rule out the possibility of other flying devices or intelligent beings visiting the planet either from uh, the oceanic bottoms or uh, deeper areas or uh, from other areas in space. But I am positive that we have the technology, I can even name you the companies and people involved, in making high-speed electric aircraft that do look, strange enough, like a, a saucer. What sort of proof can one furnish for that? Oh, good grief. Uh, the briefcase I've got down here is uh, full of documented evidence that is not all secret. Um, if you go to... Uh, to the, um, the records of the New York Herald Tribune, the newspaper is now defunct. I think it's being stored in the Wisconsin um, State Historical Society. Uh, and look for November 20th, 21st, and 22nd, 1955. There are three articles in the series on uh, antigravity and the various companies and people involved in the research in the United States, Japan, Europe. The list is uh, like a who's who of nuclear physics. It was written by Ansel E. Talbert, the science and aviation editor for the New York Herald Tribune at that time. You can look there. You can look in the um, electrical engineering index for that period between 55 and 58. That's a long time ago. Yes. 57, about uh, March, the security curtain went down. And there were, at that time, over 100 published universities and organizations, including the Gravity Research Foundation, which is still operational in Gravity Village in the United States. There were over 100 of these things operating to develop gravity, uh, the control of it as a power source and communication and, and uh, locomotion, etc. Now, in 57, the blanket went down with security, and there was no more reported uh, news on it to say either that it was a dead-end uh, research avenue, that everybody had stopped working on it, or that it was highly successful and there had been a few breakthroughs. There was just nothing. It went quiet. And if you go back in the period and look, you will see that for a number of years after 57, there was no mention of this sort of research in print. Behind the scenes, there was a lot of discussion, and even Walt Disney's, sorry, MGM Studios made the uh, movie The Forbidden Planet, revealing at that time a lot, as though it were fiction, of the technology and why it had to be covered up. I think Walter Pidgeon started that, and he did a good job. Prepare your minds for a new scale of physical scientific values, gentlemen.
7,800 levels. Basically, they decided that mankind wasn't ready for it yet because he'd proceed to misuse it like he had the uh, atom or the hydrogen bomb. Now, recent evidence is very hard to get. However, in this country, a little leak occurred over here with William H. Martin in the Nation Review. Um, May of 1973 or 4, I believe. I, I can't remember now. Um, he... Um, published an article on Pine Gap and how Nixon had intended to use it in 1975 to uh, solve the energy crisis by announcing a new method of electromagnetic propulsion which would be based uh, from the Pine Gap facility. Well now, from my knowledge of the, of the technology, what small knowledge I do have from my uh, little viewpoint, uh, Pine Gap has all of the inherent uh, uh, descriptions necessary for a high voltage, low frequency, power broadcast station to broadcast electricity to various receivers like cars and submarines and uh, aircraft that are tuned to that power station. It's just a more efficient um, version of the Exmouth facility here at the Northwest Cape. Um, so it's, <coughs> it's right here on our doorstep, is it? Oh, yes. The big question you have to ask yourself, uh, Guy, is why would such a thing be kept secret? I mean, People at the levels that are covering it up, uh, I, I know some of them uh, personally, and they aren't, in my opinion, villains. They're very uh, sincere humanists. They are trying to solve planet Earth, uh, trying to bring unity their way. You speak of them as though they were, they were collective rather yes. than singular, is that right? Yes. Um, Dr. Keeble, uh, as I mentioned before in uh, Melbourne at the Aeronautical Research Lab, tried to explain to me about they, he mentioned we as though it was they, an organization, a group of scientists, uh, academics, industrialists, he, he couldn't be exact. Now, he never put a name to it, but I said, well, do you mean like a club? And he said, yes, but no. Um, we are aware of these problems, and we're trying to solve them in the best way we know how. Uh, granted, there are things that should be kept uh, from the public eye, until we do have some sort of a unity in the world economy. Uh, but I think the manner in which it's uh, been uh, gone about is most unfortunate. Uh, I would not have taken the same tag myself. The power politics involved in keeping the secrets that we now have across the planet have allowed, well, in my opinion, groups that aren't uh, capable of handling uh, control of the planet to take power. So what basically you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we've got a situation where you maintain various countries have perhaps a top-level intelligentsia who are in possession of a common set of facts which yes. which transpose country boundaries now and it's a worldwide sort of yes. thing. In Russia, uh, involved in this would be the Russian physicist who's been in the news recently uh, with the civil rights movements, Dr. Andrei Sakharov. Also in his country, uh, an ex-KGB agent, some 25 years, but a physicist, and uh, a former uh, hydrogen bomb uh, project uh, development engineer, or sorry, physicist, is uh, Dr. Bruno uh, Pontecorvo, working on gravitic engines in Siberia. Um, as I told you, in the States, it was uh, Dr. Teller and affiliates there. I don't know all of their names. But uh, these people have all been working together as um, scientists who go above governments. And look, they're sincere. I can't blame them for doing this. It's just that they have lost control of what they tried to set up. H has that association got a name? I don't think so. When I worked with the uh, FBI, there was a political and financial institution that I was um, ordered to investigate with many other agents, and it was called the, uh, the Illuminati, which is a general term meaning the enlightened or the uh, wise ones. Um, it, uh, the investigation of this led me to the Council on Foreign Relations and to the Club of Rome, which are linked by joint directorships under Carol Wilson. Um, this is, again, another tale, but you put yourself in the scientist's position in the mid-50s. What you see is that you've got a technology that, if announced to the public, would cause mass reactions in the economy, in social moves, and in, in cultural reactions that could probably bring about the demise of the whole human civilization. A simple example would be this. 
as a scientist you come out in the mid 50s and you say we have a process which will allow us to get rid of tires allow us to get rid of the petrol engine hence the petrol hence all the uh, dependent industries uh, it'll be available for you in 24 months time and it'll only cost you three or four thousand dollars now what kind of right mind would buy a new petrol engine car if he could have one of the new ones in two years that don't need roads and uh, run on electricity and no uh, petrol necessary they'd all stop their buying trends which would then collapse the economies that would be building the other one in 24 months if you had a central world authority uh, like Dr. Pache's Club of Rome group want then if you announced when you controlled all the nations and the economies if you announced and said uh, we've got a new car that does this nobody would panic because they know that if their industry became redundant they would be retrained and paid while they're doing it in some other support industry we don't have that uh, facility on the planet at the moment because we're greatly disordered and many of the cultures fight against each other scientists industrialists engineers found this problem in the mid 50s now we're playing their part so we sit here and we say how do we get world unity the united nations the league of nations had failed you couldn't get any two or three of them to agree to turn their sovereignty over to a third party you couldn't come out and field an army from the united nations or league of nations or any anywhere even a corporate army and tell the people of earth you're taking over as some people have suggested the multinationals might do you can't do that because the mass resistance would be worse than the, the french resistance to hitler it would destroy the unity they were trying to get so by peaceful discussion over the uh, conference table and by force it wasn't possible yet as the scientific community looked at this new technology it reached into all human endeavor touched many points of life they said look if we develop this completely develop it into a social technological integrated model away from the rest of people in islands or in back rooms however we do it keep it quiet even from the politicians at some point later after 1956 57 58 some point later we'll have it ready to announce to the world as a global system then all we've got to do is figure out how to convince them to give it a try in unity right well this this was 20 years ago mm -hmm. are we now saying that this is approaching the time i think we are and it's not like some prophecy or something it's just looking at events in the media for the first 10 years of that 20 year period you're talking about people that saw ufos or flying saucers were nuts they were played that way in the media it was a bad thing to even talk about it now toward the end of this 20 year period if you see one you're a great guy in the neighborhood everybody wants to talk to you. everybody wants to know you pilots physicists all kinds of people are coming forward now presidents dictators yes i've seen a ufo now to me the shift in the public conditioning uh, medium is to get people ready for the announcement of the new technology now scientists aren't going to come out industrialists aren't going to come out and say okay here it is children here you go the new model for planet earth using this technology must be independent of any established government or order it can't be russian or capitalist or dictatorial it's got to be independent and the only way you can do it is a an external culture whether it be called from the ocean bottom uh, whether it's from the Bermuda Triangle or whether it's from outer space they have got to see it in this way so that for a short time the masses will overlook their cultural differences to unite to form this one world order then after seven or eight years if you can hold the ruse that long you explain to them this is how we brought peace I still maintain I don't think that it'll work because at the top these organizations are fighting I'd like to ask you a direct question you work in the field of anti-gravitics could you make what we call a flying saucer oh yes with adequate funds and time sure uh, i'd still be doing it uh, for the research organizations if i hadn't differed in philosophy that's where i got in trouble because i stood up and said why are you doing this and uh, it wasn't for me to know ufos if they don't exist or these electric flying saucers uh, if they don't exist in our current technology i'll give it to the world I'll be a hero, but I'll tell you right now, I don't need to do that. It's already done. This does not mean that in the past, before 47, 49, whenever the first flying saucers were uh, supposedly sighted in this planet, does not mean that the time before that was uh, to be explained by Earth technology. It wasn't. Even back in the Bible, in uh, uh, Moses' encounter with God, uh, in the flaming bush, and... Uh, don't uh, walk on this ground with your shoes on take one off it sounded like he was in a field at any rate uh, Ezekiel's flaming chariot uh, you go back 
thousands of years and you find we had encounters with things that could only be explained in their own words as being from the heavens. In the last 2,000 years after the uh, birth of Christ, we find that uh, these encounter cases were, uh, many of them more bizarre, where they didn't have the same good side to them. Uh, people uh, suffered headaches, uh, some cases disappearance, livestock were uh, cut apart and the blood drained out of them. You see it quite frequently now. It seems as though the more recent uh, contact cases from these extraterrestrial origins have been malevolent or bad, whereas the Old Testament versions were benevolent or good. We do have the technology now to um, give UFOs with electric flying saucers to the world. It is a, when I say we, it's a joint scientific effort from many of the countries of the world, Russia, the United States, England, Canada. Now, it is just the manner in which to announce it. What we have here is the tip of the iceberg with the anti-gravity device, the flying saucer we've been discussing. There are many other things that the technology offers. New medicine, which allows limbs to be regrown through electric field processes and plasma research, uh, bioplasma, the uh, uh, tissue uh, re restructuring. We have uh, devices which can transmit power around the entire planet without wires so that you can tune to uh, electricity stations like you would tune to a radio station, but it would run your house or your caravan or wherever you are in the bush or the water or the air. We have theory now, but I don't think any practical devices that would allow us to go faster than the speed of light and traverse many light years of distance in a very, very short time using the same technique that we used to break the sound barrier where we warp the shock wave. Perhaps this is where Star Trek developed their terminology, Warp Factor 1 and Warp Factor 2. We have devices to make weapons, which is an unfortunate thing. It could be used for other applications, but in transmitting power in little hand or backpack units, or even um, on tops of uh, the decks of ships uh, that shoot smoke rings or charged particle rings like smoke rings at targets long distances away and strike them with uh, enough force to uh, electrocute or burn the target depending upon what frequencies are used. There are numerous things. There is even a way to use this process to control mines at a distance of 10 to 15 miles from a center, central transmitter where people aren't even aware of it during their sleep. Some what like post-hypnotic suggestion. This in the wrong hands is not a good tool. have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously? 